I saw an announcement for a talk the other day, which was the war on error. Now, that's cute and bad in very many ways. But um, it, also, it also sells this idea that if only we can get rid of individual errors, we can make the system safer. There seems to be this orthodox consensus in, in, in safety, this standard model that systems are already safe and that they need protection from unreliable, erratic human beings. That all we need to do to make systems safer is to provide more procedures and more automation and tighter monitoring of performance. Then we can make our systems safer. We have to protect these already safe systems from unreliable human beings. But are the systems that we run already safe, basically safe? In fact, when you look at it, these systems themselves are deeply conflicted and imperfect. They always have to meet multiple goals that are, are in opposition at the same time and always under the pressure of limited resources. It's only people who can actually hold together such inherent imperfection. It's only people who can create safety through practice at all levels of an organization. Systems are not basically safe and we are not custodians of already safe systems. That's not to say that the assumption isn't popular, because it is. I've seen, and you undoubtedly have seen things like that too, emails from managers imploring people to stop making errors, imploring people to follow the rules. I've seen, you know, all you need to do is walk into a control room, right? And what you see is big posters, you know, which basically say, follow the rules, right? Um, and uh, in, you know, this, this is, can be seen in all, all kinds of settings in society, in fact. Um, it is as if, once again, we have this assumption that if only people can stick to the rules and stop making errors, we will have a safe system. That's an illusion. It's as if safety is something that we need to take away from the system. If only we take away errors and violations and incidents, then we'll have a safe system. Right? So if we just ask everybody to try a little harder, we'll have a safe system. I don't think that that strategy has a good track record. I don't think history is on the side of that strategy. However, very often, we don't know what else to do. So we will write another little memo. We will write another little email that says, stop making errors, please. Stop, stop violating my rules. I remind all the operators of what is applicable relative to paragraph 8.3, right? That this should be done. Well, have you ever tried to figure out why it isn't done, right? Any investigation as to the multiple constraints and opposing goals that operate on your system that make it impossible for people to do this, right? Um, those are more interesting questions, of course. So I think what we should do is invert the perspective. Rather than seeing safety as the absence of something, the absence of errors, the absence of violations, and, and the absence of incidents, we should see safety as the presence of something. But the presence of what? When you study practice carefully, really get into the messy details. What you see under difficult circumstances is that people can still make things go right because of their adaptive capacity, because of their ability to recognize, adapt to, and absorb changes and disruptions, some of which may even fall way outside of what the system is designed or trained to handle. People's adaptive capacity. That's, in some sense, why we call it resilience. Right? In fact, I think resilience is a much more interesting word than safety. Right? It's more dynamic, it's more ad adaptive, and it's more people-oriented in a way, um, or systems-oriented in the, in, the, in, the, in the 21st century sense of that word. Um, resilience is about the ability to, to bounce back. That's, in fact, where the Latin word comes from. Um, the ability to accommodate change and to absorb disruptions without crumbling, without breaking down, without catastrophic failure. Um, when we study complex operating worlds, what we want to do is understand people's uh, uh, abilities that, that allow them to adapt safely under pressure. What are some of the ways in which they build in a little extra operating margin because they know that 10 minutes from now there will be a cognitive flow all of a sudden of pressures and demands that escalate 
how do people actually manage these fluctuating pressures in practice so that they can remain successful under a range of circumstances? Um, Dave Woods has a, has a great example of, of an anesthesiologist who, um, in prepping a patient for surgery, uh, decides that it could be very smart to uh, put some extra lines in, in this patient to manage the cardiovascular physiology of this patient uh, in case there should be a lot of blood loss, right? Which is not good if you lose a lot of blood, then a, a whole host of functions all of a sudden becomes very difficult to manage. Um, so they put in some extra lines before the surgery. Now that may seem very simple. <laughs> we do this all the time. And, and in fact, this is the interesting thing that many strategies that are oriented at making things more resilient happen out of sight. They are not the, 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 the beautiful, you know, uh, dramatic stories. No, they're the everyday stories of adaptation and anticipation. And this, this issue of, of groups and people, experts remaining sensitive to the possibility of failure and trying to insulate and invest against it. They put in extra lines. Now, um, is, there an, is there a cost associated with putting in extra lines? Yeah, there is. The lines cost something, by the way. They don't cost a whole lot taken you know, on a healthcare budget. Um, but there will undoubtedly be bean counting managers who go, oh, you know, why did you use 15 lines? You know, whereas your colleague only uses five for this typical operation. Right? And if you do that 20 times, right, you, you may get in trouble. Uh, you may not. This, this, this uh, could very much depend on the circumstances. But there's other costs. There may be line sepsis. Right? You stick in lines in a body and funny things can happen. Right? Uh, thrombophilitis, phlebitis, uh, the, the issue of, uh, of, of blood clotting as a result of you sticking in a line, which can lead to other problems later on. Um, so it's not without a cost. So what we see expertise as is this ability to dynamically balance these sources of safety and risk. I'm putting in extra lines because it will allow me to respond quicker if there is more blood loss than we right now anticipate. But 20 years ago when I was doing this, I saw a lot, right? So I need to anticipate this. And yes, there is a cost. But I finally balance these sources of risk and safety so as to increase the chances of producing a safe outcome. That is what we understand resilience to be. This is these little micro situations of the expression of resilience, how people put in extra margin in order to be able to adapt safely under pressure. But you have to understand the messy details of what it means to practice in order to see that and in order to see how it actually creates safety. So, as I said, resilience is about this, this constant calibration and recalibration of safety and risk, this constant calibration of your model of risk. In fact, um, we see teams and organizations that are good at this do the following things. The first is that they never take past success as a guarantee of future safety. The fact that this went right yesterday doesn't mean it will go right today. Past results are no reason for them to be confident that their adaptive strategies will keep on working in the current situation. Right? The second thing they do is they keep a discussion of risk alive even when everything looks safe. Because that things look safe doesn't mean they are. Sources of risk may have subtly shifted in ways that are very difficult to recognize. Right? Um, but if you don't keep that discussion of risk alive, even when everything looks safe, then what may happen is that your model of risk, oh, this patient will be all right, I've seen this before, right? That your model of risk remains or becomes stale and obsolete and wrong. So we see these groups invest in a constant updating of this model of risk, right? Is my model still up to date? Here's the third thing that they do. They are able to bring in different and fresh perspectives. They listen to minority viewpoints. They take those minority viewpoints seriously. They invite doubt. And they manage to stay curious and open-minded. And the fourth thing that these teams and organizations do that are good at this is they almost always have somebody or some function who has the resources to put the foot down 
and make an activity stop or invest in safety even when everybody else says, oh no, you can't do that. We have acute production goals. We need to push 55 airplanes through your sector. You know, we have to do this. We have lots of pressures. To have somebody or some function that says, no, we're not doing it, and the courage to say no can be critical to invest in safety in circumstances that actually require it, but where the whole system is under pressure to actually acknowledge production pressures instead. Um, in order to, to, to see how those four points work out and how they work out in practice and how to recognize how teams and organizations do this, I think we actually once again have to shift this idea of what an organization is or what a team is. It's been very popular to look at organizations as if they are a Cartesian world machine, a, a system of, of uh, system is a large word, um, a configuration of parts and interactions. And in order to keep a machine working, you, you check the quality of the parts and you oil lubricate the interactions. And that's all you need to do, right? And, or at some point you update it. And, um, I think we should be looking at organizations as living systems instead. Um, if we want to really understand resilience, we have to shift our metaphor. And in fact, resilience is taking a lot of inspiration from the biological sciences right in this regard, because they are very adaptive. Well, some biological systems more than others. But um, let me give you an example. If I, um, uh, I have an eight-year-old, uh, uh, among other kids. But the eight-year-old rides his bike um, uh, alone in Lund, where we live. And in order to keep him safe, what do I do as a parent? Do I go, you know, check his, check his knee and say, oh, will this component hold up during the bike ride? Right? I mean, that's hardly an interesting question. What is interesting to keep my eight-year-old safe during a bike ride by himself in Lund is for me to understand what the harmful influences are that are circling around him as he rides his bike. What is the traffic situation, the situation at certain points? What are other threats, criminality, things that I need to stay abreast of in my community of what's going on? Those are questions that I want to ask to keep a living system healthy. Right? I want to check on that system's ability to resist, deal, and absorb these harmful influences. But in order to do that, I have to constantly keep updating my model of what those harmful influences are. Otherwise, I may be stale, which is, of course, what teenagers, I don't have teenagers yet, but what teenagers always accuse their parents of, that their model is obsolete. Right? Oh, no, dad, this is not dangerous at all. Right? Just let me drive with my boyfriend in your car. Right? Um, the model of risk we get accused of is stale and obsolete and wrong, even though we might very well believe it's right. But um, in that case, we might have to listen to minority viewpoints. <laughs> um, so what I want to conclude on when it comes to resilience is we already have pretty good ways of knowing whether organizations are, are faster, better, cheaper. All of these things are pretty measurable, countable. But do we know whether organizations are becoming less resilient as a result? I think we should be adding resilience as a fourth management variable. And I think by asking these four questions right, that, we, that, we, that we ran through, do you take past success as a guarantee of future safety? Do you keep updating your model of risk right, by keeping this discussion alive? Um, are you able to bring in fresh and different perspectives and minority viewpoints? And do you have somebody with the resources to put the foot down? Those four questions, I think, are one critical way to go forward and just perhaps keep businesses sustainable. Thank you very much.